Hello! In this video, I would like to talk about my Super Probe. If you, like me, count electronics as one of your hobbies, you'll have a collection of tools, such as this multimeter, or this logic probe. I don't tend to spend very much on my equipment, so these are not particularly fine specimens. This multimeter performs the most useful basic functions, measuring voltage, current, resistance, continuity, and so on, but misses out on the features found on more expensive models, such as measuring frequency, capacitance, or temperature. This logic probe is, well, just a logic probe. It does the job competently and has helped me a lot with my projects, but it would be nice if it could at least be used as a logic pulser to inject signals into the circuit under test. I could buy a separate pulser, of course, but the more tools you have out on your workbench, the more they tend to get in the way. When I was browsing electronics projects on YouTube one evening, I came across someone's video demonstrating their version of the Super Pro. This fascinating project combined the best parts of a multimeter with the best parts of a logic probe a wide array of different functions in a small, handheld package. A quick search led to the website by the name of Mondo Technology, which features many interesting PIC projects, including the Super Probe I'd seen in the video. The hardware is wonderfully simple, just a single PIC 16A 870 with a 20 MHz crystal and support capacitors, plus 10 resistors and two switches. The software is provided as both object code and source code, so you can either program it directly, without modification, or amend it for your own needs. I ordered most of the components for the project from the Bitsbox website, with the notable exception of the LED display, which I ordered from the eBay seller Protopic. The enclosure, power switch and sockets here, are from Maplin, as are most of the external connectors, apart from the crocodile clips, which were from Klaus Olsen. The probe tip is simply a darning needle. Aside from the power switch, the user input comes from these two buttons, one at the top, and one on the bottom. I think I'm slowly getting better at working with plastic, helped by a new and more precise high-speed rotary tool. This is the first project where I've had to leave holes that are not concealed by an external nut or lip to hide rough or wobbly cuts. Two round holes for the buttons, and a rectangular one in the lid for the display. If anyone has any tips for working with plastic, I'd really appreciate them. One thing I learned with this project is to wrap a piece of masking tape around the tip of needle files when using them to neaten the edges of holes. All it takes otherwise is one slip in the heat of the moment and you've got a nice deep scratch on the enclosure. This is all very well, but what does the device actually do? As the name suggests, it can be used as a regular logic probe. Here I've got a simple crystal oscillator circuit, and touching different points on the circuit with a probe tip indicates whether they are logic high or logic low with an H or an L on the display. So there is an H, that point is high, that point is low, and there is an L. However, as this is a super probe, I can switch to a different mode by holding down the lower button and tapping the upper button. If I select this mode, the frequency counter, I can check that the output of the oscillator is 10 MHz, as I'd expect from the 10 MHz crystal on board. I find the output point is there. The M on the right of the display indicates that the result is in megahertz. Holding down the button on the bottom hides the SI prefix to show an additional decimal place. The probe's tip can be unplugged to reveal a 2mm socket on the front. Standard 2mm probe leads can be plugged into the unit if required, which may be more practical depending on the circumstances. Alternatively, I can build different types of a cable with fresh 2mm plugs such as this lead with a crocodile clip on the end. This plug and socket approach extends to the other end of the unit where I can unplug the standard logic probe style crocodile clips. This switches automatically to an internal battery so I can use the logic probe without too many trailing wires. Battery powered operation is especially useful when combined with this socket on top of the probe for testing components. Had I not measured a 10 MHz frequency earlier, I could have checked the capacitors in the circuit by inserting them here and using the probe's capacitance meter. This works by timing how long it takes to charge the capacitor via a 100K resistor and is very handy when attempting to decipher the very peculiar markings you find on some capacitors. This one's reading 32.6p for picofarads and it's a 33 picofarad capacitor, so that's Close enough, I think. 
Those of you who are familiar with the Super Probe will have noticed by now that something isn't quite the same, and this is because I am not using the original Super Probe software. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with the original software, of course. However, some of its features are of rather limited use to me. I've never needed to control servo, and I don't live in a country that uses the NTSC television standard, for example. I couldn't find a 16F870, so I'm using the pin-compatible 16F876A instead. This is a much beefier pick, and the increased RAM and program memory makes developing the software in C viable. I have therefore re-implemented the functions that I find useful in C, and added a handful of my own at the same time. One such mode is a simple resistance meter. It's pretty inaccurate at the low end of the scale, but is a handy way to double-check values before inserting the resistor into a circuit, just in case you mistook a purple stripe for a brown one, or read the stripes in the wrong order. This is something that would likely be quite awkward to write in assembly, but having access to multiplication, division, and floating point maths makes it a doddle in C. Another mode can be used to read the ROM code from one wire devices, such as this DS18B20. Tapping the button steps through the four screens of hex digits that make up the 64-bit code. The decimal point at the bottom indicates which of the four parts you're looking at. This is a digital thermometer, and by switching the probe to the temperature mode, I can take a reading from it. The simplicity of the hardware, coupled with the comparative ease of C programming, renders customising the Super Probe for your own needs painless. Or, of course, you can stick with the original software and have a wide array of common functions already written for you. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Luhan Monat of the Mondo Technology website for developing this excellent project. It's been great fun to build, and is an invaluable addition to my toolbox. Maybe this video has piqued your own interest in building a Super Probe for yourself. Thanks for watching.